Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood, and I'm here with a very special guest, activist, kind of journalist, uh, Esha Krishna Swami. I hope I pronounced that. Perfect. Oh, I did it. Yay. I didn't screw yeah. it up. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't white guy it up too much. Um, so you actually were introduced to me by um, Jeff Epstein from Citizens Media TV. Not the yeah, guy. Not, that, that, yeah. <laughs> not the guy that the CIA pulled out and is still alive somewhere. But the the actually the guy that's very knowledgeable on MMT. Um, yeah. And I always got to give him a shout out and a plug. I have a whole MMT playlist on the show to any new viewers. Please check that out if you want to learn about MMT. It basically explains what the federal government is doing right now during this stimulus by just giving the banks a bunch of money. But that's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> um, so you're an, you're an activist. Uh, we were having an online conversation between you, Jeff, and myself about what to do and then, of course, Bernie drops out. So that's all of us uh, Bernie supporters or people that had even just an inkling of hope that he might get into the White House. Because if he got the nomination, we all knew the Democratic Party was the biggest obstacle. Um, he could crush Trump, in my opinion. So now what is the, everyone's asking, what do we do now? What do we do now? What do we do now? You have some very clear, distinct ideas on that. Why don't you share those with us? First thing, let me tell you what we should not do. We should not wait four years because climate change is right around the corner. We do not have four years to wait. If we don't get carbon neutrality, as in if we don't, um, by 2030, civilization ends at 2050. So we do not have much time. If not sooner. Wait. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes some climate scientists say that they are too, they've underestimated how bad climate change is. So we can't wait for four years. That's the one thing we can't do. Um, why not? Because electoral politics, it's so fair and, and every vote <laughs> matters. And why would you not have faith in our electoral system? <laughs> well, um, it, it starts with the media, of course, mm -hmm. and then everything goes downhill. And yeah, and I don't have faith. I honestly don't everyone like our media system is the worst because climate change is an actual existential crisis and what they're what, what are they covering russia gate all the time and it's really getting um and the thing is that because they don't cover it like it's an existential crisis it gives people like trump so much credence that it's bullshit but am i allowed to say that i'm so sorry yeah, you can swear um, it's all. But, God, oh my God, I swear all the time. That's the that's uh, that's lemon water compared to what I throw out here. You're all good. Uh, okay, um, so it's all BS, and and it gives Trump leverage because people uh, like the corporate media is not acting like climate change is an existential threat, and I have no idea why. Well, that's such a great point. Um, I, I've talked about this. I mean, the, the the I know the reason why. I think it's 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 all you got to do is watch literally. I've, I've, I've watched a Russiagate segment by Rachel Maddow and that literally was sponsored by Boeing, a defense contractor who needs a new boogeyman. And then literally they cut to a commercial from like Shell Oil. So like the oil companies buy all this ad time and what they're doing is they're paying for favorable coverage. Boeing isn't trying to sell, oh, oh, hey, honey, the new F-18s are here. They're not trying to sell us products. <laughs> they're like, you know, Ford or somebody like that. They're trying, they're buying favorable coverage. So they're not gonna be skewered. And that's why we just wasted four years talking about Russia, Russia, Russia. And now we're trying to blame COVID on China. It's a China virus. Well, China and Russia and Pakistan and India all just agreed to trade without using the dollar. All these Central Asian countries just agreed to trade in commerce. They've already, Russia and China have already said no to the petrodollar because China created the petrol yuan, right? So they've said, by American empire, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And what is so, you bring up such a great point about the media. Imagine, imagine if the media screamed about climate change the way they are about COVID-19. Imagine if the whole planet, we're seeing it, I'm seeing, oh, we could mobilize the whole planet. Because, you know, while COVID, I'm oh, sure it's serious and people are dying, it's a serious thing. How many people, we're talking, COVID-19 is not gonna wipe out the human race. Climate crisis is. The, the collapse of the climate is gonna kill everybody on this planet, as you just said. And you're seeing in real time, boy, we could do this. 
we could mobilize the whole, the way all Ford and General Motors are gonna make ventilators and this company is, you know, used to make t-shirts and now they're making masks and everybody's coming together and all these doctors are sharing information. We should be doing that with climate change, but we're not because the fossil fuel industry makes trillions of dollars. And if the, the only way for us to survive is the whole planet has to pivot away from fossil fuels, has to be off of it, but by, as you said, by 2030. And so the fossil fuel industry has doubled down hundreds of millions of, excuse me, hundreds of billions of dollars in climate change denial. Absolutely. And on top of that, what people don't realize is that regardless of how much you and I recycle and use like ride our bikes, it does not matter because there are 100 companies that pollute more than the rest of the entire world combined. So until we rein in these 100 companies, no matter how much you recycle, how much you ride your bike, whatever, it won't matter. Well, it's interesting. I will, I will make this point right now. I, I mean, I agree with you, but the one evidence we are seeing, I live in Los Angeles and this is the cleanest air we've ever had because mm -hmm. nobody's driving. So that to me says, yes, and I'm not excusing those hundred companies, they're awful and we need to, um, mobilized to, to, to uh, resist against them. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I am just seeing, again, to the point of we could mobilize if the 99% if the really got together, look what's happening. No one is driving. No one is going. And the air quality in Los Angeles is cleaner than, than I've ever seen it. And I've lived here for over 20 years. Um, Why don't we have high-speed rails mm -hmm. in Los Angeles so that you don't have to be stuck in traffic for two hours? Yeah. And that, that's where the mobilization versus individual action makes a big difference. So let's talk about that. What should we be doing now? I mean, that's a great point. They've talked about high-speed rail just in the state of California for 10 years, and it's never happened. They've spent billions of dollars. It's all gone down a, a hole, and a bunch of contractors and politicians and family members, I'm sure, just all got big checks or whatever. Um, so what, what should we be doing now as people on what? the left, true left, not the fakey vote any blue will do, you know, the term, pro I don't even want to call myself a progressive anymore because that's been watered down. That's just like <laughs> a co- I call myself a Maoist, no. <laughs> <laughs> right on, I've never heard that. So what do we do now? What do, we, what do we do, all of us on the true left? Well, the thing that is missing is that we don't have enough of us. Hmm. So we need to be talking to our neighbors. We need to be making more and more people political because I kind of got the, like, I, when I was canvassing for Bernie, I canvassed in four states. I went to South Carolina, New York, Michigan, New Hampshire. And what I noticed is that getting those left ideas to people was not hard. Once you told them, hey, Medicare for all, they were like, oh, that's a great idea. But what was hard was they had, like, giving them a framework. They were completely in the dark. And so bringing them even just like a little bit of like light, that was the hardest part. And the only reason we can't get any action done is because we don't have 10 million more people with us doing it. And so we need to kind of make everyone understand these basic truths. Do not believe, like whenever the US government tells you they can't do something, that's a big lie because we know for a fact that the president can start a nuclear war unilaterally all by himself. So whenever they they say, oh, the US government cannot build high-speed rails, that's a lie. We have the Fifth Amendment where we can have the takings clause, we can take the whatever land we want and we can totally build high-speed rails. So most of what the media tries to do is to confuse people into saying that the US government does not have the power to do something and just don't believe that. Well, I think you bring up a great point. And, and honestly, the opportunity here to convince people and to, to increase our numbers, as you say, which is correct, this is, there's an opportunity here because everyone, I'm not hearing, you know what I'm not hearing these last three weeks? How are we going to pay for it? Nobody's saying that anymore. Everybody's saying, I don't give a shit, pay for it. Everybody mm -hmm. just saw the banks get $4.25 trillion and we but all get- lost in 10 minutes. Yeah. Like that, they got it like that. And we're maybe gonna get a $1,200 check that's in advance on our um, next year's tax return. I don't think people understand that $1,200 is not free money from the government. So if you have 
get a thousand dollar tax refund next year, you're going to owe the government 200 bucks. I hope everybody really understands that. So everyone's going, wait a minute, how come we don't have this? How come we have to ship masks from China? How come ventilators aren't made here? Oh, thanks to NAFTA and toxic capitalism, all of our manufacturing jobs got shipped overseas. And we're seeing because Americans are getting very creative and there's a lot of sort of inspirational things happening, which I think is an opportunity to do what you're talking about, which is to get more people on our side. Everyone's like, oh God, so if I get COVID-19 and I, even if with insurance, I'm going to owe 20 or $30,000 if I go to the hospital for two weeks. Yeah. Everyone's like, now we need Medicare for all. So now's the opportunity for us to go, Hey, remember you called us crazy socialists and we're two on the left. That's all we're talking about is free healthcare and a government that has money and resources. It can just give the, we could just, this, well, they could just go, Hey, Oh, you have crushing student loan debt. $1.6 trillion. It's gone. We just took care of it. We just, we just wiped that out. You know, we're, we're, we're um, mobilizing people from nursing schools like they're, we're graduating them sooner. We're getting doctors out of retirement. What if we did that with a Green New Deal? What if we put everybody to work? I mean, we could put everybody to work right now making respirators and N95 masks Absolutely. and all that stuff. And we could just say, hey, the government has the money for all of this. Nobody asks how we're going to pay for the next war. Nobody asked that. It was the thing that was so disappointing about Bernie, especially in the last debate on March 15th. That was his opportunity to show the world, the country, he was the leader we needed. When Joe Biden goes, I get to pay for Medicare for all with his fucking demented rapist brain, Bernie <laughs> didn't go, um, hey, Joe, nobody asks how we're going to pay for war. And you know yeah. how we're going to pay for Medicare for all? The same way we pay for these wars. The Fed's just going to fucking write a check for it. <laughs> and I actually, I'll send you my tweet, but I actually have a video of the Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke saying that he printed money in order to bail out the banks in 2008. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw it. Stephanie Kelton retweeted that. I showed that on the show. It's, a, it's, a, it's like, it's, send it to me because I'll play it again. Because it's, he just says, they're like on 60 Minutes, like, how do you do that? He goes, oh, you just, you just email it. It's a thing and you, bam, it's done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. where, where should, what else should we be doing? Well, that is the first thing. Um, and, and the second thing is that um, what I noticed, okay, so this is going to be a little, the American left, okay, what we've noticed is Trump is friends with Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro is friends with Orban and Netanyahu and Modi. The right is very connected with each other, if you've noticed internationally. I think the left needs to connect with everyone internationally. So we need to con connect with the Brazilian left and the UK left, mm. the labor movement. And um, well, hopefully there is still a left in Hungary that's alive and that because the right is uh, because when they connect globally like that, they can mobilize super fast and we cannot afford to leave that um, level of organization to them. Yeah, I think this is the time to organize. I mean, we're seeing already in Los Angeles now, it started on Monday and it's now gone to 30 different fast foods. So I just want to, on a small level, there's a McDonald's in Crenshaw where uh, one of the employees got COVID. They said, we're not safe. McDonald's wasn't cleaning the facility. They weren't giving the employees masks and protective gloves and gear. And, so, and they weren't giving them extra pay. And so these minimum wage workers said, we're done. And they started a strike. And because you can only get drive through now, they got in their cars and they drove around oh. and that's how they did their strike and the whole neighborhood came out. And now there's something like, as of yesterday, and the number might have risen, there was something like 30 fast food restaurants throughout Los Angeles where they said, we're on strike, we ain't doing this. Um, because yes, the medical staff is frontline workers and we need to take care of them, protect them. But those people will be the first ones to tell you, I signed up for this. I signed up to put myself at risk of infectious diseases and whatever else. I'm flipping burgers at 10 bucks an hour, $11 an hour. I didn't sign up to put my life on the line to do this. Well, you know, all the times Trump demonizes about um, undocumented immigrants, guess what? Now they're essential workers oh. because they're farm workers. Yes, they're farm workers. They're unloading the trucks. They're doing all this labor. You know, they're doing all this work that we need. And it's like, the, what we're seeing, this COVID-19 is hopefully showing to all the people that you're talking about that we need to kind of, uh, um, you know, get into our way of thinking, get them, on, get them over to the left. Everyone, 
that hasn't paid as close attention as folks like you and I have are starting to go, wait a minute, this capitalism is pretty brutal. And oh, yeah. the worker, we need them. Absolutely. And on top of it, what we what a lot of Americans don't realize is that America is so jaded with I like to use the word American supremacy because it's that it's not American exceptionalism mm -hmm. that like everything that they try today in America, they've tried in like, for example, the drug war, uh, militarization of the police. They've tried it in South America 10 to, in 1986. But the chicken always come, comes home to roost. So we have to stop the empire when it's abroad because if it's coming back home it's really we're really screwed and that is the one thing that the american left needs to understand is they always experiment internationally first and then they'll come here so we need that's why we need to uh, stop being so isolated in our american supremacy and connect with it because right now trump is um doing some sort of unprecedented unprecedented invasion thingy in venezuela i believe and oh, let's, oh, oh, and and let's not forget um, how the U.S. government apparently China was selling, sending these masks to Barbados, and the U.S. government literally acted like pirates and took that ship and just diverted it over here. So we are acting completely barbaric, like literally like pirates. Oh yeah, we're doing that. We're we're still sanctioning Iran and killing oh, our yeah. citizens. We're still keeping all of our seven or eight wars. I've lost track going. Um, we're literally bombing people and sanctioning people in the middle of a pandemic. And what I hope Americans are waking up to, first of all, we're seeing all these fast food worker strikes. We're seeing the Amazon strike and people are starting to realize these frontline workers, everyone's getting around them. I'm seeing hashtag general strike way more on social media than I've ever seen. And they're seeing rent strikes are being organized because guess what? Rent's going to be due in two weeks. Rent's going to be due uh, or two, three weeks. Rent's going to be due May 1st, and it's going to be again due June 1st. And no one's going to be working. This, this quarantine's going to go into May and probably June, if not longer. And what's going to happen? And, and they're, oh, you can't evict. After, you, you can, you, they can't evict you if you haven't paid rent for three months. But you know what they, the, 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 the fine print on that is? You still owe three or four months rent. So with interest. With interest. The, uh, other countries, Venezuela is a country that just pays, is paying everyone's rent. Evil socialist Venezuela, paying everyone's rent, giving everybody wages. They're doing that in, in Australia. People are getting three grand a month. And it's yeah. like uh, they're doing rent freezes in other countries. So what's going to happen in about two, three, four months? We're gonna, right now we're at 10% unemployment. We're going to be at 20 or 30% unemployment. We're going to have That's anywhere. worse than the Great Depression. Yes. We're going to have 50 to 100 million people out of work in this country. That's going to be huge. And when that happens, those people are going to start listening to democratic socialism. They're going to start listening to really hard left ideas. And it's up to us to just welcome them in and don't, it's okay. It all, we all had to wake up someday because I lost my house 10 years ago because Obama, a little bit of Bush, but Obama let the banks steal my house. And I, they told me, I'm telling the story every, almost every episode because what's this stimulus, this new stimulus bill is almost three times as much bailout money as Bush and Obama combined. And they use that last one to steal people's homes. This one they're going to use to steal your businesses and your homes. They told me, Graham, if your payment is more than 30 days late, then we have all this stimulus money to help you. We'll put you on a three-month forbearance. They did, I did that. I said, okay, I don't like, I don't, I've never been late. I had over a 700 credit score. I waited till after 30 days. Then I called Indy Mac and they said, now there's this stimulus money to help you out. They put me on a three month forbearance. They cut my mortgage in half. At the end of the three months, we're going to restructure your loan. That's what all this did. We want to keep people in their homes. Like, oh, whew, of course, doesn't make sense to let people foreclose. It's great. At the end of the three months, fine print. Oh, you don't qualify for the loan restructure. Sorry, now you owe us three months back pay. They're going to do that again, but now they're going to do it with everybody's businesses. They're going to come put a lien on your home because of your, your medical records, because of your student debt, because you're back on your rent. They're going to be evicting people. That's what this is all about. And people oh, need to absolutely. wake up. And the thing is that it's uh, for the rich, they think different. I, 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 they, they think differently because it's all about power. So they don't like for them, they know that there are just a few of them and many of us. 
And so they are trying their best to make sure you're not awake and you think this is the state of nature as opposed to conscious decisions by our government. For example, in China, they've actually the US has more cases in China because you know what happens in China during the quarantine? Whenever somebody stepped out, they would they check their temperature on the subway. When they came out of the subway, they checked their temperature. And then they built these mobile hospitals in about three days and they'd send them to the hospital to check for the COVID virus. Mm -hmm. South Korea has phone booths that, where you can get tested for the COVID virus. And in America, it's just no one is, no one is there. You're just like, if you go to the emergency room because you're really sick, then they count you. So God knows how many people we really have. And yesterday in New York, apparently they had a mass grave where they had to like dump a whole bunch of bodies in, which is painful, but I mean, it's like it should, it, that's not how a virus like should be. We could, we did better with the span, with this 1919 Spanish flu. And so there are things that the government can do to make it better, but CNN and the news media always act like this is a state of nature when it's a political decision. Oh yeah, capitalism. I mean, even if, even if the virus happened organically, which I don't know. <laughs> Some stuff got released from Fort Detrick. I don't trust this government at all. Um, I you know, have a lot of faith in China's government, but if I was gonna pick between who was more evil, I'd say the United States empire oh, without, no doubt about without it. a shadow China of a doubt. It's not bombing eight countries. Yeah, yeah, China, <laughs> China hasn't bombed eight countries. They don't spend more money on surveillance than anybody else. Um, but even if this did happen organically, capitalism and America's uh, just profit first, for-profit healthcare, for-profit prisons, for-profit everything, um, screwing over the workers so that CEOs and, and executives can get you know bigger payouts. We're seeing it's making this pandemic worse in this country. This country is like a pandemic. We don't have. There's not a government. There's just a collection of corporations that that just sort of run everything. I mean, we don't there's yes. these two parties are a joke. The Democrats, all, you know, AOC and Bernie gave these big speeches after they fucking voted for that stimulus plan. I don't want to hear from them anymore. I don't want to hear from the Democratic Party. You cannot reform that party from within. It would literally be like joining a drug cartel thinking you're going to get them <laughs> to stop selling drugs and start selling, you know, baby formula. <laughs> I, I use the ISIS example, but I like yours better. <laughs> I say, like, would you think about joining ISIS in order to get them to stop being ISIS? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> we're going to get them. And then and I, I got into ISIS and they said, we're not going to cut off as many people's heads. And so I took that to a little small victory for us. We got a little exactly. bit of a victory. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a, and, and that's kind of the way the Democratic Party mobilized. And there's a lot of things that like, Okay, another thing that the establishment Democrats love doing is like tricking you into thinking that any, anytime you question the system, you're a conspiracy theorist. But um, I'm sorry, but the thing is that like it's, it's with the JFK assassination. Do you think it's like some random person yeah. or do you think it's an organization whose main purpose is to assassinate democratically elected leaders who assassinated a democratically elected leader? After a while, the conspiracy theories become more ridiculous than the the, the accident, coincidence theory explanations become more ridiculous. And so, with, with, so, like I said, I was in four states. I did not see any operations, uh, operation of like Joe Biden in Michigan, in South Carolina. Literally, there was none. How did he win it? I mean, what I do know is that in South Carolina, they have a private company that um, does the ballots and they're all electronic ballots. And um, in Iowa, we know about the acronym and the, how it's like, oh, it was like Pete Buttigieg and Joe Biden's campaign donating to this. And it was like a little thing. And I'm actually question, going to question the results of the Democratic primary because it does not make sense with what I saw on the ground in the eyes. Like, I just... Well, there's that evidence, which is just your, your right in front of you evidence, which is great. There's the double digit exit poll discrepancies in all of the districts where Biden won and Bernie had double digit exit poll oh, victories. Really? It's all electronic voting. So oh, okay. it's like, it, it, it's all a, like everything, every like Biden, Bernie has double digit exit poll wins and yet Biden still, went, it did, none of it made sense. And then, and then add insult to it, Bernie never called it out. AOC never called it out. 
Oh, yeah. And, and did you want to remind people what Biden did in Ukraine when they had uh, less like less than two percent difference in um, elections, like from the exit polls? They armed Nazis. Yeah, that's what they that's that's who Joe Biden is. And the fact that I have even friends of mine who were like, yeah, but I, it, anyone's better than Trump. And I'm like, well, Biden dropped more bombs than Trump has. Uh, more foreclosures happened under Biden's watch. Um, Chelsea Manning was jailed when Biden was VP. Uh, the Flint water started. Yemen started. I mean, I, I can. Uh, yeah, like why didn't he do when he when he was in power? He could have done so many things when he was VP, when he was had Obama's right ear, and he didn't. The only thing he did was he convinced Obama to bomb Libya because mm -hmm. Obama was unsure about it until Biden was like, "Yeah, go for it." Yeah, well, him and Hillary. Biden and Hillary really helped uh, Obama bomb. That was great. That was Hillary's war. She profited from it. It's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, the thing is that the lesser evilism argument is getting more and more ridiculous. There is a point when you can't be like, oh, am I going to vote for Joseph Goebbels or Adolf Eichmann? Like, <laughs> the... <laughs> Yeah, that's a great analogy. I always use the Ted, Ted Bundy is better than Jeffrey Dahmer because he didn't eat his victims, Esha. He just <laughs> murdered him. He wasn't a monster, you know. But then did, 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 uh, Ted Bundy raped the victim, so did, it's better to eat them dead, right? Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe, <laughs> right, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, that's right. Dahmer didn't rape him. He just ate him. So maybe Dahmer is the lesser of two evils. Thank you for making that point. That's such a great argument. Um, well, uh, as I really appreciate you taking the time and, and, and sharing this. Where can people follow your work? Oh, come and check out my podcast at historically.substack.com. I actually have um, an interview with Graham Elwood where he talks about the housing crisis and how you lost your house. All right, because you do that with Jeff, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that interview I did with Jeff, uh, we actually did that in uh, in Philly or Jersey or something like that over the summer. Uh, so check out that. I'll put the link to that in the show notes, everybody. Um, but And then what's your social media so people can follow oh, it? Oh, Isha Legal, E-S-H-A Legal. And my podcast account is historically H I S T. Oh, H-I-S-T-O-R-I-C underscore L-Y. Are you an attorney? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I used to be a, a corporate lawyer, but then I kind of saw how the, well, I was, uh, I, I, I saw how the uh, sauce was made, for example, like, um, so like there's this, all, all these law firms have this, this section called government relations. And that's, they call it lobbying, but that's a nice part. That's not what lobbying actually is. People who are corporate attorneys for the corporation write the laws and give it to Congress who pass it without even reading it. Like that's what lobbying actually is. You see, I mean, it's not uh, some somebody going to convince your congressman to vote for the corporate measure. Mm -hmm. It's the corporations telling the congressman what to vote, like, like literally writing the law for them. Wow. Well, I, I congratulate you for choosing uh, your soul over money and leaving, Absolutely. <laughs> and leaving that and joining us and joining the crazy left over here as we all have had to join for one reason or another. Um, you saw that. I saw my house get taken, went to war zones as a comedian. Yeah, we all have our own path uh, to see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, I, I once like, I was like, look, kind of writing regulations for the FDA, and I'm like, oh my god, that's disgusting. I don't know a thing about drugs. What the bleep am I doing? Wow. And that's when I decided to quit corporate law and go into um, academia and teaching and be more of an activist side because that was just like shocked me and it grossed me out. Well. Good for you, and uh, follow Esha. Thank you for taking time to be on the show. Listen to their podcast, and we'll have you back on to talk about more uh, more activism, as I'm sure this summer is going to get very interesting. <laughs> oh, absolutely, and um, be sure to come to the, if you guys are, if it still goes on in September, we're going to have the Modern Monetary Conference in D.C. this time. Please come. I'll be there if they're letting Yeah, that'd be great. I'll be there. All right, Asha, thank you so much for joining everybody. Like, share, and subscribe, and uh, support the show any way you can. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Hey, everybody. Like, share, and subscribe. 
hit the bell notification button and the subscribe button, even if you've done it before because they're unsubscribing many of you every day. Watch the ads all the way through. If you click skip ad, I don't get paid. Also, support us at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood. Rockfin.com is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. All my videos are on Rockfin ad free. Thanks for watching.